Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to begin with just a couple moments of silent prelude where we can pause and reflect and focus our hearts and our minds on the worship service ahead. Heavenly Father, we do indeed thank you for the gift that you give us in your word as we have come to hear your word proclaimed and to focus our hearts and our minds on you and to grow closer to you today. We pray that we can achieve that in this worship service, that your spirit would be here working in us and guiding us and leading us and strengthening us for the week to come. We pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Our call to worship is from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. You would rise with me and we will confess our sin together using the words on the screen. Merciful God and Heavenly Father, whose grace endures to all generations, you are patient and long-suffering and will forgive the sins and transgressions of those who truly repent. Look with compassion upon your people and hear their supplications. We have sinned against you and are unworthy of your goodness and love. Remember not our transgressions, have mercy upon us, and help us, O God. Grant us remission of all our sins, and give us the grace of your Holy Spirit, that we may amend our ways, and with you obtain everlasting life through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. From Isaiah chapter 1, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 15, verses 15 to 21. O Lord, you know, remember me and visit me, and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your forbearance take me not away. Know that for your sake I bear reproach. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. I did not sit in the company of revelers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone because your hand was upon me, for you had filled me with indignation. Why has my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Will you be to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail? Therefore thus says the Lord, If you return, I will restore you, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, You shall be as my mouth. They shall turn to you, but you shall not turn to them. And I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, declares the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. Our psalm is from Psalm 26. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers, 
and I will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great assembly I will bless the Lord. Our epistle lesson is from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I will be reading the gospel lesson before the sermon. If you would please rise as we confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our gospel lesson for today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Here ends the reading of God's word. You may be seated. This is a passage that Matthew has been building up to, and the lectionary text has been really hinting at all these things that point to uh, Peter and this, con- I don't know if you call it, I think he's already converted, but this experience that Peter has with, with Christ in recognizing who the Christ is. Um, 
he begins, Jesus begins with the question, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And he doesn't even ask, who do people say that I am? But who do people say that the Son of Man is? With this apocalyptic tone, um, the Son of Man was understood to be the one who was going to be coming from all the different Old Testament prophecies and all the different ways that you could interpret them. And the disciples kind of give a conglomerate that just, it's all-encompassing of every answer that somebody could have given to, um, to be able... Yeah, somebody's at the door. There we go. He's, Mary Jo will get it. I love distractions. Anyway, all the different possible answers that any would have, would have normally answered. And they covered all the different groups. It would almost be as if somebody asked a theological question today, and, and I answered with, well, the Baptists would say this, the Lutherans would say that, the Catholics would say this, the those would say that. And you just kind of give a an answer that is everything that doesn't really pinpoint anything. And, and Jesus is kind of, I almost want to picture his tone. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. What about, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Jesus set it up that way. First, he asked, who do people in general say that the son of man is? And then he turned to them And he said, but who do you say that I am? So no longer just the Son of Man that could have been, depending on the group, if they believed in Jesus was the Son of Man or not, whatever their answer might have been, to who do you say that I am? And I believe that this text should be read in such a way that we don't only focus on the disciples or we don't only focus on Peter but that if Jesus were in the room having this same conversation with each and every one of us, Jesus is asking you, who do you say that I am? This is a very personal text. And if you, if you don't have the answer to that question, it, it's, it's time to search your soul. It's time to spend time in the word. It's time to reflect with other Christians around you because Jesus wants you to have the answer. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And um, Peter, Simon, is, is the one who I kind of enjoy following throughout the Gospels. Whatever his progression is, no matter where he is or how far along he is in his faith, he seems to be the one that will blurt out the answer, whether it be really, really right, like this instance, or really, really wrong, like, um, let's say, at the foot washing. Not just my feet, wash my whole body. He, he doesn't care what everybody else in the room thinks. He's going to speak, right? And this time, this time, Peter hits the nail on the head. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Let's look back at Peter's answer here for just a second. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. By calling him Christ, that was not just the word that we understand Christ to be, but um, in Peter's day and age, it would have been understood to be the one who was to come, to right all the wrong between God and man, that the answer to all of the Old Testament prophecies, it was to call him the anointed one, the one who would reign into all eternity. So there was a, there's a lot of weight into that word. And sometimes, even as Christians, when, um, when we use the word, we talk about Jesus Christ, we aren't thinking about the title that the Christ, Messiah, anointed one, king, prophet, priest, all of these words are contained in that Uh, We don't think of the vastness of it sometimes, and sometimes we ought to slow down. Um, Also makes me wonder, you know, the world doesn't think of any of those at all when they use the Lord's name in vain either. So there are two directions to go with that. Okay, Jesus in turn turns to Simon Peter and, and blessed are you, There is blessing showering down from heaven 
to you. And Jesus sees this because he, can, he knows Peter and he knows that Peter didn't figure this out on his own. He said, you had help. God, my Father in heaven, has revealed this to you. This has been revealed to you. And in this day and age, it might be easy to read that and say, well, it's no fair. Peter had the Father flip a switch for him and send it down, right? What about me? I don't, the, what, what about me? And, and that could be an argument somebody could take. And really it's not an argument that we have because we have been given the full revelation of God in the word of God and it is here for us. It is the blessing that has trickled down from heaven to us so that we would know everything that we need to know about God. And we are therefore without excuse we can't, we can't put ourselves into the individual situation that Peter was in where he received it from God because we've been blessed with the same blessing. God revealed it to us through the word. It is here for us. Verse 18, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Um, there, there are so many different things that I could talk about. The, the name change from Simon to Peter, that Peter is a rock. And I, I think of the term rock, and even my last name, uh, Steen, Dahl, Stone, is the word Steen. And, and so there's, some, there's always been a little bit of a, the back of my mind, a joke about my stubbornness coming from my name, that like I'm as stubborn as a rock sometimes, or as thick as a rock. And I think... Peter getting this name rock has a little bit of this, especially if you look at his character. Again, like the foot washing. Oh, you washed my whole body. You're, you're doing it wrong, Jesus. Do it the way I tell you to. Or when, when Jesus calls him out to the, on the water to him and Peter walks out in faith and then gets scared of the storm and starts to sink. And if you remember what I just preached on a few weeks ago in that text, Jesus turns to him, and, and it's not just why do you doubt, but in the Greek, that, that word doubt is, Peter, why, why are you, it's, it's almost like as if to say, why are you so stubborn in, in the fact that you have two minds? You have one mind that has this huge faith that's ready to jump in the water and walk out to me, and, and the other mind that makes you want to sink because you doubt and you forget and you leave it behind. And, and there's... A bit of that going on in Peter. Um, but you know what is wonderful? As much as I can make Peter sound like a bad guy by all of his, the wrong things he did and whatever stubbornness he might have and all the times that he was trying to tell Jesus how it was, who did Jesus use? Over and over again, I, Matthew points us out, Jesus used Peter to be the, the, the head of the church. On this rock, I will build my church. And if Jesus can use Peter for such a task as that, can he not use each and every one of you? Can he not use me? This, this text just brings that to light over and over again for us. You can be used by God for his purposes. And not just that you can be, but God wants to use each and every one of you for his purposes. He has a will and a desire for you in his life, and he wants to put you to work. Verse 19. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, one way of interpreting this would be to look at this and say that was for Peter and Peter only and nobody else. Um, um, I believe that this has more to do with the church than just Peter because Jesus just said, on you, I'm going to build my church. And then the next thing out of his mouth is you're going to have the keys to bind and to loose. And whatever you bind in heaven is found and whatever you loose in heaven is on earth. So we have this statement and what I believe we're talking about here is truly the forgiveness of sins, okay? Um, if you see your brother or your sister or your friend sinning out in the world and you go to them 
and say, I have seen you sin and I forgive you and I want you to know that God forgives you for that too. What a wonderful blessing to be able to do. But as we see in the text here, it is also two-sided. If you see that sin and you go to the person and you say, what you have done is unforgivable. Is God going to forgive them of that sin if the fellow Christian denies that forgiveness? If it's been declared to them that they are not forgiven? The power God gives to Peter here is such to... I don't think we should be going around telling people that they're not forgivable. Hmm, let me think. Is there anywhere else in this book that tells people to, tells us Christians to go tell somebody that they're not forgiven? There isn't. Which brings me to kind of, we're in the same topic, but a slightly different point. When you feel called to call somebody out of their sin, when you see somebody, whether it's your family or friend or a coworker or somebody you've just stumbled upon or a homeless person in the parking lot, whatever it is, when you see somebody sinning, what is your motivation to tell them that they're sinning? And I believe that a big problem with the perception of Christianity in the world is that people's motivation is wrong when it comes to calling out people in sin. I think a lot of the times when somebody is telling someone else that they're sinning, it's a pride issue. It's one of those hurt people, hurt people issues. I was told that I was doing that wrong when I was younger and I fixed it. So I'm going to lord it over you and say I'm better than you and I don't do that anymore. So you shouldn't either. Is is that our motivation as Christians to tell people that they're sinning so that we can feel better about ourselves? It sure shouldn't be. Could be shame. Oh, shame on you. That shouldn't be our motivation either. I think there's a lot of different motivations that we can come across for pointing out somebody else's sin. But in the end, the only motivation that we should have for pointing out somebody else's sin is we're worried about their salvation. And we want to come to them in such a way that when we do point out their sin, they don't reject us, but that they are able to see that we have concern for their everlasting soul and if we can't show them concern for their everlasting soul if we don't care about the person that much what business do we have talking to them about their sin there does come a point in time where i I believe that we need to kick the dust off of our sandals you know if it's been rejected But if our motivation has been truly from the heart in desiring to save that person's soul, or maybe even they're a Christian walking with the Lord, but yet they're kind of wandering astray into an area of their life or struggling in an area of their life, when we go to them, it's it's not just, let me help to bring you back on track, but it's with the fear that their actions are going to lead them completely away. Don't, don't let wrong motivations entice you into correcting someone. Verse 20, then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. It was still in secrecy mode. He was already beginning to have problems with the Pharisees. That started about two chapters ago um, where there was a shift in the book of Matthew where all of a sudden the Pharisees, instead of just coming and asking questions, all of a sudden they're trying to trap him or they're trying to arrest him. Everything is, there's a definite shift there and and it's the beginning of the end um, uh, in the midst of the Pharisees' attitude towards Jesus. So if I back up here in the text a little bit, I want to look at Peter's confession. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I want to think about, if we make that personal for us, Why is Peter's confession so important? And why does it become so important for us to have that confession, to know who Christ is, who the Son of the living God is, who the Messiah is, in a personal way? 
Why is it important? Why is it meaningful? And I want to look at Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. And if you want to have this one in your memory, if you can think of Roman numerals, you know, Romans is the book, and in 10, XX, uh, two, two tens, chapter 10, verse 10, and I'm just going verse before and verse after that, but to throw a little address in there for you, Romans 10, 10, starting uh, a little early, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Confession, our ability to confess Christ as our Savior, is tied to our very salvation. And and Peter's ability to figure this out not just on his own, but he, you know, he had some help, direct revelation from God. If you struggle with doubt, maybe you could get some direct help from God in the midst of that doubt to help you in that struggle. Um, I, I don't believe that there is a, a way to 100% erase all doubt. Otherwise, I don't think Jesus would have talked about faith in sizes of a mustard seed. I think he would have used, you know, mountains instead of mustard seeds to talk about our faith and, um, and the blessings that that faith is. But if this text is calling to us to do anything, it's to, to relive, relook at our confession, to, to confess it. And even, I would go so far as to say, were the other disciples there present blessed by Peter's confession? I, I think so. I think so. Would your family members, friends, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, would they be blessed by hearing your confession as a Christian, who Jesus is to you? I think he would. I I think they would. Um, And and Romans 10.10 is such a firm reminder of what that blessing is all about. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for yet another opportunity to hear your word. And we pray that as we hear this today, Peter's confession of who you are, the Christ, the Messiah, Lord, help that confession to be echoing in us, and not just in a personal way that we hold it inside, but in a way that we share it with our family and friends to help them to come to that same confession. We pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Are there any prayer requests? Charlene. Was it Trisha? Patricia. Yes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do um, lift up these requests to you. I think of Patricia and her battle with cancer. I pray that you would be watching over her and giving her strength in the midst of what she is facing. Be with her family and friends as they show their support as well. Draw her close to you. Help her to draw close to you in this time. I also lift up to you Charlene's daughter's mother-in-law um, who is struggling with this coronavirus and a Uh, physical way and I pray that you would help her in her healing process and give her strength as she fights this and I also pray for Charlene's uncle that you would be watching um, over him you know that situation better than any of us do and so we pray that you would be working in his life I also pray Lord for the all those who are affected by the fires down in California 
I, I pray that you would be um, watching over them. We, we've kind of experienced pretty closely what that can do to a community. So we pray that you would be helping them to come together and to work together to um, put those fires out and keep people safe. I also lift up to you Annalise Meyer, who last month fell, and she has a couple fractures in her vertebrae, different vertebrae, and I pray that you would be helping her in the midst of trying to manage pain um, while she heals in, in her, her body that doesn't want to heal as fast as it used to. And so I pray that you be with her and give her the patience as she tries to endure that. I also pray for Bev Dennis as she, as her husband, went home to be with the Lord. Uh, I think it was last week or maybe two weeks ago. But um, I do pray that you be with their family and that you'll be watching over them as well. We lift up all these prayers to you as well as all the prayers in our hearts that are unspoken, Lord. We pray that you would be um, guiding us in our lives, helping us to have a um, firm confession of you as our Lord, and we continue as he taught us. Let us rise as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.